pretty good. You're back at Ground Zero Salem once again with your intrepid host, Pat. And we're listening to Dreams of the Drowned. Um, this is going to be a 7-inch update. Had a bunch of lovely little EPs kind of pile up over the course of the past two or three months. 7 inches are one of my favorite formats um, because I'm that much of a fan of Inconvenience. Uh, but in the background, spinning is Dreams of the Drowned, a avant-garde French black metal band. One of the first releases from my friend John's label, Cult of Nine Records out of Syracuse, New York. Uh, I think he's already knocking it out of the park with releases like this and the Fed Ash landfill split. This is post-punk leaning black metal. Uh, I can hear the, the killing joke all over this with a lot of the vocal effects and drum patterns and stuff like that. I'm also told it's uh, got a strong kind of Ved Buen Zen sort of thing. I'm just starting to sink my teeth into that band, so I'll uh, take everyone's word for it. I just got everything Ved Buen Zen put out in the past couple of months, and I'll probably be talking about it, but that's an album and a demo. But uh, at any rate, I think this is a great release. I'm going to leave a link to their band camp and leave a link also to the Cult of Nine's web store. Big Cartel, I think, is what they have. So, on to 7 Inches. I have a pile here. I've got a bunch of them. A few gifts, a few things I picked up randomly. One or two nostalgia grabs. Just a whole little mixed bag of uh, hardcore and metal. You know, you know what to expect with me. First up, something that's been discussed a little bit here on uh, YouTube, but definitely deserves more praise. Marty Worms own The Glorious Dead with their two-song single here. Uh, Imperator of the Desiccated. So, two-song single, studio song on side A, live song on side B. Uh, this song, Mangled Celebration, is gotten a lot of spins, physically and digitally, with me since I got this a couple of months ago. Uh, it's just death metal perfection, as far as I'm concerned. Not to be hyperbolic, you know, um, or sycophantic to Marty, but... I listen to a lot of death metal. I've been checking out all the latest releases from the 20 Buck Spin bands and newer Dark Descent stuff, and I, as a rule, generally really enjoy that stuff. But there's just something about the songwriting, especially on the studio track, that really takes into account, like, building energy. It's got a lot of just feral energy to it that fucking rules. The riffing is almost thrashy at points, and it just executes into this awesome fucking slow, you know, drudgy, kind of heavy, doomy riff that I love. Um, it's just fucking choice songwriting. I can't wait to hear what they do um, in terms of their LP that they're recording. I love the rehearsal demo that they did earlier this year. This came out on Bind Rune and Iwas Productions BT Dubs. So, scoop up a copy if you still can. Next up, a little gift from Mike. My buddy Mike from Ontario. He sent me this lovely repress of the Slaughter EP, Nocturnal Hell. This is legendary Canadian proto-death metal, early death metal, 80s death metal, whatever you want to call it. Uh, legendary band that jammed with Chuck Schuldiner at one point rough, stripped-down, chainsaw guitar, punkish, fucking death metal insanity. If you like old death metal and you have not somehow, I don't know what rock you've been living under, if you haven't checked out Slaughter, you need to. If you like Necrophagia, if you like Repulsion, I mean, this is all, this is all uh, starting ground stuff for everything that happened later on in the 90s as far as death metal goes and this is a, a great EP that they recorded way back in 1986 one two fuck you slaughter nocturnal hell came out on urban grandeur um so I just flipped a bunch of stuff purged a bunch of my collection stuff that was just taking up space and when I do that that is one of my justifications for spending an exorbitant amount of money on actual rare records. I usually don't go out of my way to spend a crazy amount, especially on EPs, but um, I was at residency 
and brought in a milk crate full of vinyl tapes and CDs. And I saw this and I couldn't say no. Anything that's on like any of those old labels that did a lot of death metal EPs in the early 90s, namely Thrash Records, in the case of this, Thrash Records and Seraphic Decay, shit like that. I'll usually buy it sight unseen, even if I'm not familiar with the band, just because I love the, the feel and the smell and usually the sound of like these old singles and seven inches. This is a Swedish band called Sorcery. I'd heard of them. You know, I'm sure I read about them in the Swedish death metal book. They might even be on that compilation. I don't remember, uh, but I picked it up. I mean, old school style, looking at the thanks list here, I was like, yeah, I think I need this. Carbonized, entombed, pestilence, grotesque, merciless, Tiamat, carnage. And it's just two songs, uh, two rippers, not your typical of the day Swedish death metal sound really at all. Not really uh, doing that kind of HM2 buzzsaw thing. It's way more like kind of barbaric and satanic sounding. Kind of mid-range raspy growls with like a few deep growls behind them. Um, just kind of kind of insane sounding really. Um, the Rite of Sacrifice, the B-side song, has some tasteful keyboards all over it. Um, another band with an early example of death metal utilizing keyboards, um, you know, along with Nocturnus and very few others uh, at the time. So that's cool in a historic context. This one, uh, Presser. Chicago, early, technical, brutal death metal stuff. This is the 7-inch they did right before the first full-length Solstice of Oppression. And... You know, if you know Oppressor, this is not going to be any really different or, oh, they hadn't really focused their sound yet, you know, before the couple of records they did after. It's very precise, technically sound, um, guttural, but also, like, there's weird jazzy, like, atheist kind of elements to it. It's, it's good. Uh, the recording's a sight more rough than the full length. Um, but if you want to hear the beginnings of Brutal Death Metal, Technical Brutal Death Metal, from one of the bands who did it quite well from the Chicago area, pull up the songs on YouTube. Yeah, the 7-inch actually wasn't too bad, so if you can find it on Discogs, it might be worth your while. But it's, it's two songs. It's a single. Valley of Thorns and I Am Darkness came out in 90... recorded in 94, probably came out in 95 or so. Funeral Mask Records out of uh, Townsend, Massachusetts. No cool colors or anything like that, so no need to show you that. There's a center labels. Uh, also from Mike, more recent shipment from Mr. Mike up in Ontario, the Game Flexi. He just saw them play up there. This is called Who Will Play? Flexi 7-inch, two-sided. I don't know if I've seen that many two-sided Flexis. Mostly they're one-sided, I feel like. I don't really go out of my way to collect flexies. This is cool to have. Uh, old friend of mine, Ola, does the vocals on this. She runs Quality Control HQ, a great hardcore label out of Britain. Um, very Japanese influenced uh, by, you know, Gizm and Odoo and the like, Lip Cream, that sort of stuff. There's a certain kind of echo and reverb on the vocals and the vocal placement is odd, which like in a good way, which to me sounds pretty Japanese inspired. You know, fast, crazed, hardcore punk stuff. They have a full length that I haven't checked out yet, but uh, most of the stuff on this label I, I love, and I pick up whatever I can. So, who will play? I don't know. A couple of releases from Splattered Records up next. Um, I've been sleeping on talking about these for so long that they're already out of print. Uh, Splattered does really limited releases of stuff, and it seems like... This uh, small label out of New York is taken off like a rocket, which is great. One Reed Bremer, a.k.a. Reed Wolf, runs this uh, label. This guy used to sing for Speed Wolf. His new band, Overdose, was one of their first releases, two-song single again. Like Speed Wolf, it's very Motorhead-inspired. A lot less kind of thrashy or speed metal than Speed Wolf was. A little bit more rock and roll or punk. Uh you know, motor charged, if you will, kind of a very overused term, but certainly if you're a fan of Inepsy and the likes, you won't be disappointed by this. It's got a fast one and a mid-paced one, and they just came out with a 
new 7-inch that's another, another two-song single, and it's headed to my doorstep, so I'm excited. Um, this is another Splattered Records one. This is Cyanide, Your Old Man. This is great. I, I want to say 77 Punk, but I think it actually came out in 78. Uh, just real snotty, really before Oi became a thing, but it definitely sounds like the beginnings of Oi. You know, the crack and stuff like that. Um, Splatter does a really good job kind of recreating the labels of the original pressings of these. Uh, tuneful, catchy shit. Really good. Never heard of this band. Uh, Reed's definitely like a curator. You know, a guy who goes around and like a real record collector who kind of seeks this stuff out and is kind enough to bring it to us, the unwashed masses. So thank you for that, sir. And then uh, one last one here we got. Centurion, Two Wheels, BW Bitch, um, old, really obscure new wave of British heavy metal band. The Two Wheels song I, I like a lot. It's that kind of, it's even more raw than early Saxon or early Raven. It's definitely got that one foot in rock and roll, one foot in maybe 70s glam, but, um, you know, doubled the speed, real nasty, almost motorhead level kind of stuff and it's not just because of the motorcycle kind of thing that it makes me think of that but super great catchy song on the on the a side b side a little bit more almost like a i mean it's this band was considered new wave of british heavy metal i guess but it's almost more of a punk song a song on side b not as into that song um but two wheels is definitely worth it and i know and probably in some like record collecting new wave of british heavy metal circles this is like a legendary release and all that kind of thing, but really it's only side A that does it for me, but that's a jammer, so. Um, then I completed my Urko collection. You know, recently I talked about the UK hardcore stuff, um, and this is one of the bands that I kind of rediscovered via the Ian Glasper books, although it was the, his book on 90s British hardcore and punk called Armed With Anger that reminded me about these guys. I saw these guys 1999, so 20 years ago, with uh, Hell Nation and Short Hate Temper in Bradford, the 1 in 12 club. And uh, Urko are great. Nobody ever talks about them that I know, at least stateside. I don't know too many people who talk about them. I'll leave a link. They have a band camp. I think it's a Name Your Own Price with their en entire discography. You know, if you like stuff like anything from crustier bands like Doom to, I'd say, you know, fastcore, blasting fastcore stuff like Drop Dead, and maybe some stuff that's a little bit more hooky and even Japanese inspired like Nine Shocks Terror, Urko's kind of right in that sweet spot. It's really abrasive, really fast, stripped down, hardcore, hardcore punk stuff. Um, a little bit slower than like say power violence or thrash core there's a little bit bit more oomph behind it uh they do go to just fast as opposed to hyper fast sometimes you can hear the doom influence the doom uk influence in them a lot uh this may be their debut i'm not sure but it's called thrash it up i got it you know for next to nothing on inflammable material records gotta love viv and the young ones in the back there one of my favorite shows and uh, this is great. My favorite's still the the split with um, Suffer. And that's just a nasty fucking record. I think they were starting to just kind of get their footing on this one, if I'm not mis mistaken. Um, hopefully I'm not talking out of my ass and this was the last record they did or something. But their whole discography is worth listening to if you like really intense, violent, fast, hardcore stuff. Throaty, shredded vocals. Like Nine Shocks, kind of. Um... Up next, for something a little different, sort of, we have uh, the Combust Demo, pressed to 7-inch. Combust, I mean, it's exactly what you would think of by looking at this cover art. The graffiti-style font and all that stuff, honoring all the greats from the late 80s, Breakdown, Killing Time, uh, Outburst, that kind of stuff. Super bouncy, you know, tight rhythmic heavy though uh you know very crunchy and fucking metallic kind of guitar stuff i mean this is right up my alley this is a a certain corner of music that i am nuts for combust does it particularly well and it seems like there's been a groundswell of 
bands doing this style stuff all over the United States, but also a lot from New York. And there's been plenty going on in New York for, for a while now, but it seems to really be ramping up, which is great. And Combust is sick. What did this come out on? Straight and Alert Records. Good uniform choice song there. Um, this I tracked down because I didn't know it existed. This band Ricochet from Michigan. Hardcore band that was around in the 90s. I saw them once. Uh, I really freaked out when I saw that their demo was up on Bandcamp along with everything else they did. They had, Speaking of that sort of like aggressive, occasionally thrashy fast, but also sort of bouncy kind of shit, that style of um, kind of tougher hardcore, their demo was a great example of that, and I listened to it into the ground when I was a kid. So it was nice to find it digitally on Bandcamp. I didn't realize they had a 7-inch bridging the gap between that demo and their LP that was self-titled and good for what it is, but kind of out of my tastes, out of my taste zone. It was sort of a, what at the time was deemed post-hardcore, quicksand, um, I don't know, quicksand helmet, you know, almost alternative metal kind of, kind of thing. Uh, not really, not really my thing. I like, I like Slip by Quicksand as much as the next guy. Great record, but I don't really go out of my way to listen to much else in that style. Uh, what I've discovered was this seven inch that sort of bridged the gap sonically between the two called Evolve. Um, not sure what year this came out, came out on initial, um, 92. When I saw them, they were probably touring off of this. It might have been the LP, though. Um, so, yeah, we're going from this sort of aggro, I'd say New York-inspired, metallic, uh, crunchy, you know, rhythmically, maybe a little bit on the, the hip-hop influence side, into post-hardcore, and this kind of bridges the gap, and I dig it. Um, it's cool to hear. It still has, like, a few 4-4 four, four fast, like, old school hard hardcore inspired parts um, musically in there but it also has like a lot of cool almost industrial inspired or you know kind of more rhythmic chunky chuggy kind of parts as well so cool to hear um, very well executed music I'm glad to finally catch up with this band and discover a record that I hadn't before and finally um a one of the many records I received as a gift from Jason Hook but it was a 7 inch so I put it in the 7 inch pile and I haven't talked about it yet Brace War's Colossal um, this was a nice surprise Brace War was a pretty popular band in the mid aughts I want to say and I liked them I listened to them from time to time they seem to be sort of in the same wave of bands like Ceremony Early On and Trash Talk and a few others Outbreak that were experimenting with like high velocity kind of tempos and hardcore again, which hadn't been a thing in a while. You know, bands that were kind of utilizing almost blast beats, bands that were looking towards Infest, you know, for influences where that style of hardcore really hadn't explored power violence, you know, in that scene and used it as an influence yet. Um, everything's kind of just melded together at this point and you know, you've got a lot of newer bands that are looking into Japanese hardcore and power violence that are kind of the, of the more, like, clean-cut hardcore variety or whatever. But anyway, this was uh, Brace Wars Return from a few years ago, 2016, I think. And it's, it's only three songs, but it's masterfully fucking written. First of all, the sort of metal-style cover art I'm a big fan of right there. It's a, that's a beautiful painting. The intro is this massive-sounding, almost, like, grandiose like almost like ride the lightning era metallica kind of deal where there's like a few sweeps of acoustic guitar and it's just really awesome that like just getting you pumped people yelling brace war and over and over again in a gang chorus and then uh the two songs hidden and prophecy are fast but not as fast as i remember their early material being a little bit more powerful um, a little bit more of a metal influence you know the imprint of like leeway and um, best wishes era chromags and that kind of stuff 
just seems to be growing greater and greater by the day on today's modern hardcore bands, and I couldn't be happier about that. There's a lot of gristle and, and heaviness and heft to it, you know, and it's plenty fast, but it's there's also plenty of, uh, you know, aggro-inducing slow parts going on there, too. You can hear the influence, maybe, that these guys have been paying attention to what Power Trip has been doing and bands like that, but, uh, you know, I think they just came back to do this, and I don't know if they're going to be doing more. I, I don't really know that much about what this band is up to, but I'd like to hear a full album of stuff like this. I think this band, I know this band's from somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line. I'm not sure where. Uh, possibly Richmond. Possibly Virginia Beach, maybe. I'll have to check. At any rate, uh, great band. Good to catch back up with those guys. Fucking sick record. So that's all I got for you right now. I'm going to go edit this and then do some other shit. I hope you have a good day. Have fun. <laughs>